Hey guys, Jamie and Jeremy from Gildbrook Farm and welcome to our Q&A on the subfloor and our basement slab for our ICF mountain home build. So for those of you guys that are new to the channel, the dirt is where we share a little bit about why we do what we do, why we think what we think. And in today's episode, we're going to be answering all of your questions on our subfloor and our basement slab. Right. Also, thanks to Ariat for sponsoring today's video. We appreciate their support. All right. So I have the questions and uh, you're going to be doing all the answering since uh, you're the subcontractor. We are um, subcontracting this build ourselves, not something we had originally anticipated, but here we are. <laughs> yep. Uh, and we've done a couple of these dirt uh, Q and A's up throughout this uh, pro process of this build so far. Uh, we just had not yet covered the answers to questions on the subfloor or the slab so that's kind of what we're trying to do is get caught up here all right so i have these questions broken up into two sections so the first section is going to be about the subfloor and then the second one will be about the basement slab so <clears throat> the first question is why didn't you use floor trusses why did i not use floor trusses uh, i actually had a whole truss package priced out and they were about over two times more expensive to to use floor trusses for this particular project because it's a pretty simple 30 by 40 rectangle uh, we ended up going with 2 by 12s uh, dimensional lumber <coughs> for the strength cost and we didn't have to use two foot tall trusses which would have eaten into our ceiling space below or would have required us to build even taller basement walls to get the ceiling space so there are a number of reasons the only real advantage i think that would have happened would have been we'd have had room to run mechanicals through the trusses um, and they probably would have gone in a little quicker because they're straight and true right off the truck but uh, it was a cost thing and we had the time to do uh, dimensional lumber and it, it turned out well so so how long would you did just did a floor subfloor take us to build it took us about three weeks uh, in and out of the weather um, you know it would have taken a professional a day but you know it was the first time we ever did it and I kind of overkilled it but I'm glad I did <clears throat> second why did you use solid lumber instead of wood I-beams uh, well, I've used wood I-beams in the past, like uh, TJI and things like that. Same, kind of the same reason. Cost. Uh, another reason was they're very particular about how you can drill holes into the I-beams for things like plumbing and electrical and things like that. I've used I-beams in previous homes that I've built, and I've had good luck with them, but they were specifically engineered for that. Um, <coughs> The other thing is I just kind of don't like the idea of using OSB as structural floor members. I mean, I know they do it every day, but I just really wanted to use good old-fashioned number one southern yellow pine for my floor. And I'm glad we did. Uh, somebody said they didn't understand the Simpson hangers. It looks like they're just sticking into the foam, meaning the ICF foam. Right, the hangers that hold up the ledgers, that hold up the floor joists, that hold up the floor. Um, yeah, well, I made a little clip about it. So here's a section of leftover fox block. This is an eight inch straight block. Say so this is your wall. This will be the top of your wall. Uh, and you're going to <clears throat> measure or use a laser probably to find uh, your line for your ledger board. So generally, let's say the bottom of the ledger board, you'll snap a chalk line, the whole perimeter around, and then you'll take this ICF VL plate. This is the plate. It goes inside the foam. You cut a little slot and you slide it inside the foam. When you pour your concrete and consolidate, this is embedded in the concrete, will never go anywhere. And that's the plate that you fasten your hanger to. So, <clears throat> and then you, you, know, you mount your actual hanger to your ledger board, like so. This would go on the outside. And then when you bolt it up, say your board is in this space here, you use those eight bolts and you bolt straight into this plate. The bolts hold the board to the plate. The plate holds everything into the embedded concrete. If that uh, makes sense, then maybe I've done my job a little bit better. Like I said, you cut a slit here and that jams all the way into the concrete. That's that. That's how it works. 
Why use nails? So some of the next questions about the Advantech flooring that we're sitting on right now. Oh. Um, why use nails as spacers if the sheathing is tongue and groove? Okay, so if you can see Advantech tongue and groove subflooring, they're asking why we're using nails in between to gap, to make a gap if it's tongue and groove. The answer is it's only tongue and groove on the long side. It's not tongue and groove on the short side. So the tongue and groove keeps it together this way, uh, but you want to still have a, an expansion gap on the butt ends here. And so that's, that's the reason we do that. You don't want to press your boards right up against each other because they, they will get wet and when they swell it'll buckle up and pretty much ruin it. So you need that room for it to expand and contract. Alright, so are you going to seal the subfloor? And I don't know if the person asking this question means does Advantech need to have a sealer on it before you put your regular flooring on it or if they mean are you going to seal this to uh, while it's exposed to the elements? So I guess ask, answer both. Uh, Advantech is the way they make it, it's pretty much water, very water resistant. I wouldn't say it's waterproof, but uh, it's very water resistant. It, they have a 300 day no sand guarantee. I've seen it just sitting in water for days. It's extremely well made. So no, we will not seal the subfloor. Uh, we don't have to. Um, it air dries pretty well. Will we seal it to keep water out? Was, was that the second part? Well, the second part was, is do you need to seal it for the elements, which for the elements, are you going to put no. a plastic on it or anything? We won't seal it for any reason. We won't seal it to put down uh, the finished floor because we don't need to, and we won't seal it against the elements until, you know, while we're building. I've found that the best way to let it dry out is just to let it air dry in the wind because it only takes an hour or so. Uh, I, I did actually try to cover this with plastic uh, to help prevent it from getting wet and it ended up just holding moisture in so that was an experiment that I wanted to try but didn't work out it's best to just let it sit and and dry out so our goal really is to get it under roof but no we will not seal it uh, someone's asking about span Crete so so the question would be what what would be the difference between using regular plywood Advantech or something oh, like span Crete span Crete is like a I think a a concrete type of floor. Uh, why didn't we want to use a concrete floor since we're doing ICF? Um, and I just, you know, cost. Uh, we considered pot. We might do something similar to a spancrete or maybe an ICF type of slab for our porches, but no concrete for our interior floors. Uh, that's why we're going with Advantech and traditional lumber. And why Advantech over plywood? Is um, there well, I just Advantech is always very straight and very, it's just a really good product. Um, there is a, an argument for using something like plywood under some hardwood floors and, and different finished floor materials, um, but for our purpose, Advantech was the best choice, I think. So. Um, somebody wants to know, what is that awesome floor screwing machine? The Senko screw gun, yeah. Uh, it is just a screw gun that allows you to do floor screws or drywall screws, but it has an attachment so you can stand up and just zip your screws in. And we used, uh, I think, number eight, two and a half inch screws. Uh, every, on the Vantac, everywhere there's a little mark tells you right where to put your screws. So that's another cool feature of Advantech. Assuming your <coughs> joists are Assuming all... everything lines up correctly, yeah. So like I said, we probably used 2,000 screws and a case of 12 tubes of glue. So this floor is on here. Right. And the last question with the floor is what would you do differently? What would I do differently about the floor? This was a unique uh, build, trying to build a floor differently than normal. Like uh, traditionally we would platform frame on top of a, uh, a, a sill or a lead, uh, a sill. So in this floor we had to build it on the inside, which was unique and cool. One thing I would do differently is I would have kind of paid more attention to when they were putting the Simpson hanger plates into the wall because even though they did it with the correct spacing, it kind of threw off where I could put my joist hangers. So it threw off my 16 on center where a hanger would fall right onto the Simpson hanger, where a joist hanger would fall onto the Simpson hanger. Uh, I had to move it, which threw off my spacing for my uh, Advantech. So that 
gave us a little bit of a challenge, uh, cost us a little bit of time to refigure some, some measurements, but overall, I think that's the only, only thing I would do different. And what, one thing you could do to alleviate that is double up your ledgers. So if your ledger is bolted to the ICF wall with those hangers and you've got your eight bolts sticking out, you could bolt another ledger to that, giving you a clean, smooth surface. I think that's a little overkill and probably unnecessary, but that's one way you can do it. I don't know. I think I'd just pay attention more closely to making sure those Simpson hangers did not interfere with my joist hangers. All right, we're going to get right back to answering questions on the slab, but first we want to thank Ariat for sponsoring this video. So many of you may be familiar with Ariat International for their famous quality line of Western footwear or their English and equestrian riding apparel, but you may not be aware of their Ariat work line of world-class work boots and work apparel. We've recently upgraded our working clothes with a selection of their best, and there's a website page at the area store of everything we've chosen. For example, Jamie's chosen a Tracy composite toe work boot. This is a western style cowboy boot built with a grip strip platform, a multi-directional traction designed to deliver great slip resistance indoors and out. Non-marking Dura-Tread sole is highly abrasion and heat resistant, and it features a 9-inch shaft with 6-row western stitch patch pattern and Ariat's signature U-turn entry system, which allows easy entry regardless of the foot. Jamie's also chosen the flame-resistant Dura-Stretch Entwined Boot Cut Jeans, streamlined, attractive fit with a non-gapping waist and no chafe comfort inseams. It's Category 2 rated for safety, stretch denim, 90% cotton, 2% lycra. My choice was the Turbo 6-inch Side Zip Carbon Toe Work Boot. ATS technology with carbon toe feature, which is lighter than traditional composite toe boots to provide strength and protection. Low temperature conductivity keeps your feet warmer in colder weather and non-metallic platform for electronic security working conditions. These are a few of our favorites. We'll be covering more of them in the future, so check out the links in the video description below for the Ariat store and a link for 10% off your first order. And yeah, they really make some nice stuff. Uh, we're, yeah, they really up We're all our... kitted out right now with all the Ariat gear, and it's really nice. It's kind of brisk today, and, and yeah. stuff's pretty nice and warm. It really helped us uh, upgrade our work outfits. Um, I know everyone was asking, you guys should have, or commenting, or a lot of people out there like, you know, you guys should have some uh, safety toe shoes, and well, now we got them, so. Yeah, I'm not using, uh, I'm not wearing uh, hiking shoes or uh, muck boots yeah. anymore, so I finally got some composite toed work boots. So did she, really cool Western style. Yeah, and, uh, really nice. Yeah, they make good stuff. All right, so now back to the slab questions. And the first one is, why no mesh or rebar in the basement slab? Man, a lot of people have this like question. 50 and people ask that question. Yeah, your basement's going to crack. You're going to have all kinds of issues. Why didn't you put rebar? All right, so why no rebar? Why no wire mesh? Uh, this is not a structural garage floor that you're going to drive a truck on or, or anything like that. Um, this floor is four inch thick. 4,000 PSI with the additives um, and it has fiber mesh in it. So the fiber mesh takes the place of welded wire mesh or rebar. Uh, it's a floating slab floor, so it's just a floor. It's a, it's a concrete slab. It's not really a structural slab on grade type of situation that you would see where they lay the slab down and then build the house on top of it. The floor floats inside as a floor and that's the answer. Just right, we it. already have our footings. Right, and, and it's not structural. We didn't need all the rebar and all that mess because we use such good concrete and we put fiber mesh in it. So they engineered the mix specifically for this project. Uh, why no insulation under the slab? It's not typical here. A lot of people ask that too. I mean, I've seen it uh, done. I've seen people put uh, foil bubble foil underneath the slab, which seems to help. Uh, I've seen people use two inches of VPS foam, uh, but not around here. There, it's, uh, the, the ground temperature around here stays 50 to 55 degrees. Um, it, it's pretty warm down there. You know, there's no heat in it right now. So you can walk in there and it's, it's, it's pretty warm in, inside. So we didn't need to, um, and that's why. And if we ever decide to finish it in the future, would you? We could uh, insulate the floor above the slab if we really wanted to. Which I think uh, my st we're, might put my art studio down there in the basement, and so that might be something to consider at some point. If it's if it's too chilly down there, um, we could possibly put in a flooring, but... Um, why no plumbing or drains under the slab? 
Uh, well, I went back and forth with this. Plumbing, no, there's no bathrooms or anything down there. Uh, we thought about putting a mud sink down there, which we may do in the future. Uh, the floor drains, I ran into an issue with Plumber saying he wanted, they wouldn't let me floor drain to daylight. You had to go through to the septic system and I didn't like that idea. So we decided that if and when we do some, something in the basement plumbing wise, it'll be in the future. So never say never. All right, so why no, why are, somebody wants to know why you used sand and not gravel. Uh, it's just an option that we have here. Uh, it's a little bit less expensive and it drains just as well as gravel. Uh, we have real hard packed clay as a base and it works well in our particular situation. I don't think it would work well in every situation, but we were able to get sand, get it compacted um, at about half the price of gravel and that's why. And then after you put down the sand and you compact it, you put plastic on it and somebody wants to know why you put plastic on it. Yeah, some people it. want to know why you put plastic down. So it's a um, six mil poly vine. It's a poly plastic. They use, it, they use that as a vapor barrier. And that helps prevent water from wicking up from the ground into the concrete. Uh, it's code uh, and it's just a good idea. So it keeps your moisture away from your concrete. How much concrete did it take to, for the slab? Uh, it was a 30 by 40 slab, four inches thick, took about 16 and a half yards. Uh, and that was, we had them bring two trucks, two uh, eight and a half yard trucks, I think. And why not a pump truck? No pump trucks. Uh, we don't need a pump truck. Uh, pump trucks are very expensive, first of all, and our concrete crew had that cool gas powered buggy wheelbarrow thing, and that made really short work of that project. He just wheeled it in and out. I don't know, maybe 20, 30, 40 loads, but it was fast. It seemed to go like pretty quickly. And we had so much time for that concrete to set up just because of the temperature that nobody was really in a major hurry. So saved money on a pump truck and got the job done. And then uh, over the last couple of weeks since the basement's been done, um, we've been squeegeeing out the basement, which has been full of water, 17 gallons of water pretty much every time. We've had yeah. torrential rain. How did all the rain get in there if you have a subfloor on? Yeah, well, so this basement stairwell hole and here all around the perimeter, there's just concrete like a trough, uh, especially here at the end where the beam pockets are. The water's going to come in here. And it's going to come down, it's going to come through these little cracks, you know, there's holes, there's places for the water to get in. Uh, and so I'm really glad that we had them seal it uh, because that made it squeegee, made squeegeeing a lot easier. So, you know, we just really need to get get building to get it under roof, get it under roof. Um, it's not horrible. It's not actually as bad as I thought it might be filling up with water, but you know, when you pour a brand new basement slab you don't want to see a bunch of water down in there but yeah we tried putting plastic like he said earlier tried sealing this whole thing in plastic and it just it kind of didn't help and actually the wind just took it and yeah made a mess so our goal is to get building now so what would you do differently with the slab with the slab if you could? i would not do anything differently it was exactly the way we spec'd it so i really like it they did a very good job um and i like the burnt burn down uh, finish. finish on yeah. that. That's really nice. Yeah, he made it super smooth. Yeah, did a good job. I'm real, real happy with it. So, I said in the previous dirt videos that I take your temperature along the way. You know, self-contracting um, was not something that we had planned on doing, and it was it was a very stressful undertaking because I mean it's, you got to learn every single thing about building a house in order to know if it's done right or, or how to do it or what materials to order. So you have to try. <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you feel about it right now at this point? It's still nerve wracking. Uh, and we you know, we have a long way to go. Uh, biggest difficult biggest difficulty I think I've had is, is finding the people. Um, been struggling to find a framing crew for months and I'm hoping that I may have two two options because we are hoping to start pouring this next uh, floor, this next set of walls, hopefully this week. And if we are able to do that, we immediately have to keep going with the framing crew so that we can get this thing under roof as quickly as possible. Uh, because as soon as we pour these walls, we're just going to have a big bowl 
Yeah, it's going to be harder. To collect water and snow. So we need to get a roof over that as quickly as we can. So that's what I've been, you know, tr trying to figure out for the last few weeks, you know, in between videos, you know, just a lot of scheduling, a lot of ad admin stuff. And, and you're still, uh, like redo the blueprints a little bit. You, there's I just been made some, some changes. changes. Yeah, we moved. Well, when we were framing the floor, we made the stairwell a little wider, which needed to push this wall this way, that wall that way. So that made us reconfigure the whole bathroom to be more of a galley type bathroom and move a foot out of the master bedroom, which ended up working working out real well. But then had to move some windows. We changed some windows as well. So. Uh, and I needed to get that finalized so that I can make sure we have our rough openings for the windows correct because when they start stacking these blocks for the walls they need the rough openings because once you put the rough openings in a concrete wall that's the size window you're going to have you can't change that so a lot of stuff a lot yep. of stuff going on and uh, that about wraps it up for our subfloor and our basement slab and uh, I guess the next video is going to be pouring these walls or stacking stacking, stacking pouring yep. and pouring for so you guys should be seeing that I don't know possibly within the next week or so so fingers crossed also once again thanks to Ariat Workwear for sponsoring today's episode we love their stuff uh, thank you guys for watching we'll see you in the next video yeah, we're in compliance now yeah we're safe Thank <laughs> you.